Hey, everybody. We will give it a few minutes for everybody to roll in. If you guys want to post in the chat where you guys are, are calling in from, what organizations you're with, you can get a feel for who's here today. Actually pop that in the chat. Hey, TJ. Claudia and Hala and Thomas, hi. Anna. It's always tough going for the names on the fly. I know. <laughs> Sorry if I'm mispronouncing any of them. <laughs> hey, Lauren. <laughs> I know I'm missing a few too. Hey, Bill. Marcus, good to see you. Nancy, Stephen, Michelle, we got a good group coming in here. Rebecca and Brett. Nice number still creeping up. Let's give it one more minute here, then we'll kick into the content. Awesome. Oh, cool. That's People great. all over. Yeah, it's great. Nice. And we'll we'll reiterate it throughout the presentation, but um, we'll use the chat for some conversational stuff on the fly. And then if you've got any questions that you want, um, kind of a written answer or a link or resource, you can put those in the Q&A. Or if they're questions that are okay to hold until the end. We can tackle all of the, the Q&A questions on the fly. Any remaining time, we can either give back to everybody or um, open it up for folks to unmute um, if there's anything you want to talk through. I think we're I think we're good to get started. Ready to go, Don? Awesome. Yep, I'm ready. Let's go. All right, let's do it. So today we're talking about crypto donors, getting to know them, what these donors look like, and how they give. I am Pat Duffy, co-founder of The Giving Block. We'll touch on what my company does. And then, Dawn, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Uh, I'm Dawn Galasso. I'm the VP of Sales for Giving DNA. Giving DNA is a technology platform that analyzes your internal data around constituent and gift information, and then appends external data similar to a well screening. It provides opportunity segments for things like who are your best crypto donors or your monthly donors or your planned givers. Awesome. Okay, so um, about the, the giving block at a super high level, we started as kind of the popularizers of crypto philanthropy. We built the first uh, giving platform that was donor facing that aggregated charities that took cryptocurrency donations, built out profiles, ran campaigns, um, kind of created an ecosystem where people in the crypto community could give to nonprofits. We also built the main tech stack that nonprofits use to take crypto donations, uh, big and small. Um, from there, we added other non-cash giving methods that were driven by the same kind of tax incentivized behavior. So we now have um, awesome digital crypto giving tool that's end to end on charity sites. We have a stock giving solution that nonprofits use to accept stocks directly on their site without the back and forth. Uh, and now the integration of Chariot is the other big one. That's the main uh, DAF solution. It's like a plaid for DAF giving. It allows any donor who has money in any DAF account on any platform to check out on your actual donate page, click the donor advice fund that they have those funds in and directly issue the grant to your organization without leaving your uh, donation flow. It also prompts them to boost their gift size based on the balance within that account, increasing the average gift size. So in short, we have a um, end-to-end non-cash asset uh, donation suite for charities to accept those gifts. And then we also merged with a company called Shift4, which similar to Stripe is just a big credit card processing company. They do about $260 billion a year in credit card payments, and they're now doing the credit card processing for a lot of charities to try to drive their fees down. So St. Jude would be kind of their, their marquee uh, nonprofit. Awesome. And as I mentioned before, I'm the VP of technology sales with Giving DNA. Um, already kind of told you what Giving DNA does. Just a little background on myself. I've 
I've been over a decade in the nonprofit space, working almost entirely in data analytics. Joined the Giving DNA platform uh, two years ago um, because I really feel it's the future of well screening. And um, uh, excited to talk with Pat today about um, all things um, uh, crypto as well as any type of other types of um, non cash giving and the things that um, uh, the Giving Blocker is doing to help our, all of our mutual clients with those things. Awesome. Okay, and I think uh, Bailey on our team is going to send out the poll. Yep, I see it going live. So, um, which of these donation methods are you currently accepting? Is the question here? So everyone complete the poll here, and it'll give us kind of a, a feeling for how advanced everyone's non-cash programs are currently. And I love it. People are jumping in and and answering. Wow, interesting. Really even wow. spread. It is. One organization accepting uh, chariot, DAF integrated gifts, but not stocks and crypto. That's a really interesting one. Um, okay, I think we have 32, the folks, and I think it's enough to close the poll. Um, if we share the results, folks can see it. A lot of organizations not accepting any of these gifts on their site, including stocks, which is uh, interesting and surprising, um, but obviously a, a decent amount of nonprofits um, uh, aren't accepting any of the above. Accepting stocks only uh, is as common as accepting crypto only, which is interesting. Um, and then a decent number of organizations accepting all of these, including digital DAF transfers directly on, on site. So they don't have to direct DAF donors offsite. That's becoming a lot more popular, of course, which is exciting. I think there's three platforms that now have that. Um, that's awesome. We can move on. I think this poll is gonna be later in the presentation, that second one, so we can get into what is happening in Flat before we dig into uh, crypto specifically. Uh, so Don, I, I think you're definitely more dialed into everything going on in the sector. That's why yeah. both teams come together. Give us a little bit, I guess, from the, the Giving USA report. Yeah, so combining the Giving DNA report with just, you know, conversations that I have with our clients on a continuous basis. And this may be relevant to you guys as a, as a nonprofit also, um, but most everybody kind of shakes their head. Yes, this is the same thing we saw. 2022, about midway through the year, people were starting to get really nervous about 2022. The nonprofit space was worried about revenue. Inflation was all over the news. Inflation was really high. Um, we were talking recession like all the time. And so our clients were very, very concerned about, you know, are we going to be able to hit our revenue goals? And as they, they ended the year in 2022, most of them actually did come close to, if not hit their revenue goals. But when we started to dig beneath the surface and look at the data on the reasons why, what we found was is that almost every single of our client of our clients was actually actually had a shrinking donor pool. They were lapsing more donors than they had in the year prior. They were um, acquiring or converting non-donors into donors at a much lower rate. And so, when you're thinking about it, that means your donor pool is shrinking from year to year. Um, but what the reason why they were able to be getting to those goals was because those donors that were giving were actually giving more than they had given. They were they were being more generous than than they had been in prior years. So the idea is, is how can we engage more donors to continue to give year over year with the idea being that they continue to give at that higher level? That's how we grow our revenue. And so that's what we heard a lot. And really, it's, that trend is continuing in 2023. And an interesting thing that we uncovered also, we do a, 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 a pulse survey at the Giving, D, at Giving DNA and, and Pursuant um, around, uh, you know, how people are feeling and what they're reflecting in the year. And one of the things that we've heard continuously is that in 2023, almost every single organization's goals are at least their revenue goals for 2022, if not higher, with fewer people to complete that work. And so, you know, being able to identify those individuals as quickly as possible and steward them through an elegant experience, whether it's asking them for crypto or other non-cash assets, it becomes super critical to make sure that we're raising that money that we need to. 
Yeah, and, and Don, just to piggyback on all of that, I did a, a presentation at Planet Philanthropy uh, a couple weeks ago that was on recession proofing um, nonprofit fundraising programs, which aligns with all of the things you're hitting on, right? These uh, individual giving being down a little bit, average number of total donors, getting new donors through the door, period. A lot of nonprofits, especially smaller nonprofits who end up in the same loop, I think historically, where you double down on these sustainer donors who have given to you in the past and really invest resources, the highest rate of return, especially in recession times. And those donors tend to get older and older if you're not bringing in these newer donors, A, and then B, upgrading these newer, younger donors into a major gift type relationship which largely has to do with the way they give, right? Things like crypto or digital wallets. Um, uh, the stuff that you're hitting on is kind of interesting, but from that presentation and the conversation in that room, what we found by talking to people is a lot of nonprofits recession proofing strategies and their future proofing strategies end up being very similar. And a lot of nonprofits end up missing the gap at the same intersection, which is like a getting a higher number of donors, right? The bigger the pool is, the more you have to like push that sustainer level upgraded to major gifts. And that's, more sustainable and then B on the recession proofing piece, um, getting more donors into that mid major and planned giving type relationship is what is most recession proof, as you can see in the data that's from the report here, right? Where you can see the donors who were giving big before keep giving big and those donors who weren't giving as big, who don't make it to mid plus, um, they can evaporate when uh, economic conditions are uncertain. Exactly. Um, so then this is an extension of uh, what Dawn was just hitting on, um, you know, what's impacting nonprofits and what they're doing about it. The diversification of um, people's fundraising portfolios, especially into that mid um, major and planned giving level where donors are stickier, more sustainable and ultimately grow their giving over time. Um, a lot of this uh, tends to, um, in terms of the nonprofits most impacted come from aging donor demographics, um, where they're doubling down on the major and planned giving uh, gifts of donors who then ultimately end up exiting the donor ecosystem. They don't have that new, uh, fresh donor blood coming in, which is part of the reason why we're touching on crypto. So at a super high level, crypto, of course, younger donors using it. We'll get into the data there. DAFs are another big component here where 80% of the money in DAFs is trapped there every year and not actually distributed via grants to charities. That's $250 uh, billion dollars. Um, on an annual basis. So that's a lot of donors not a being asked for DAF gifts like we saw in the poll at the beginning. A lot of nonprofits aren't even accepting these gifts directly, let alone recommending it as an option to their donors. Um, and then B, younger donors in particular not being um, aware of when to trigger. Once the tax incentive is claimed from a DAF gift going in, there's really no incentive or timeline to push it out to the charity other than the philanthropic impact. Uh, future proofing we touch on. So like major gifts, planned giving are the most recession proof channels. We hit on it a couple of times, but important to reiterate, the larger the gift size um, from your donors, if you can move them into non-cash gifts in particular, where they make those big tax offset donations, um, those are the types of donors that end up being stickier. And then finally, asking is something we're going to talk about a lot today, which is a lot of nonprofits are asking major donors for major gifts. And then um, for younger donors, A, they're not asking for major gift type methods. You're not asking people under 40 for things like cryptocurrency, let alone accepting it. Um, and then B, even for the nonprofits who are accepting things like crypto, stocks, digital transfers via DAF, they're not proactively asking their donor support because they're used to older donors who work with advisors being prompted to kind of bring them those gifts while they're working with that tax advisor. Younger donors, because they don't work with the tax advisor, they don't work with the wealth advisor, they trade crypto, they trade stocks, they put money in a DAF. And they don't have an advisor to tell them, hey, distribute that gift to the charity before the tax deadline so that you can actually claim the full benefit of that offset. It's up to nonprofits to ask. So the nonprofits who are getting a lot of these gifts, including crypto, which we'll hit on, are the ones who are not only accepting it, but asking for it. Yeah, and Pat, to that point also, and I don't know that we reference this anywhere else, but it, it made me think of something that what we saw, and I don't think we have a statistic on this, is, is that those donors that are um, crypto donors are also more likely to have a DAF and that actually the younger generation percentage wise has more donor advised funds. Um, obviously, that's what that, that's what DAF stands for. They have more donor advised funds percentage wise than even older individuals. And when we're talking about inflation issues and recession issues, this is the time where, where if you're not leaning into things like donor advised funds, and this is more about crypto than about donor advised funds, donor advised funds, that money is already in 
that fund. So even if they are um, struggling with maybe uh, uh, inflation being up, so their dollar's not going as far, that money's already earmarked in there and they can't take it out. So that's that's a way to approach that donor who may be facing inflation issues um, and, and, and get a donation from them in a different way by accepting something different, meeting them where they can give. 100%. And we should off of that, we should really have a, a graphic at some point in one of these presentations, but you're describing a flow, um, which is A, these donors who are younger are more likely to not only have crypto, but they're actually more likely to invest in stocks as well than the average person who's above millennial or Gen Z. They're actually trading stocks at a higher rate, not just crypto. And then to your point, using DAFs at a higher rate. This is largely due to the fact that they're not being asked for these gifts by nonprofits. And they don't have advisors telling them to send these gifts to nonprofits. So like a DAF is a vehicle that you park these assets into when you don't have a charity you think accepts it, right? So if you're checking out for the charity and you can give your crypto to the charities you support, um, you would do that. But instead, these donors are giving charities 10 bucks a month with a credit card. When it comes to this big tax offset opportunity, they're literally Googling, where can I donate this crypto? What do I do with the stocks? And then these DAF platforms with like big advertising budgets are just soaking them up. That was part of our strategy is the giving block, just search engine optimization because donors were searching on the internet, where can I donate crypto? It's actually searched as much as where can I donate stocks? Um, and that's just based on donors don't see the option on charity sites. They're not asked for these options by charities. They're not working with advisors, uh, both on tax and wealth planning or telling them to send it directly to a charity. The only platforms that are really giving them this option are the platforms where they're investing, where they see that they can move this into this DAF account and get this huge tax reward. So yes, it's great. Once that money is in a DAF account, they can direct it to the charity. But what's even more important is make sure these donors can give it to you directly because once they put it in the DAF, yes, it's already locked up and they can distribute it to you, but there is no urgency. They've already gotten the tax incentive. They can send it to a charity five years from now if they want. There are no yeah. minimum requirements like there are with uh, foundations. So. They can sit on that money for as long as they want. So That's yes, you point. should be asking. Yeah, you should definitely be asking for these gifts out of their DAF accounts if they have it in there. But B, you should be talking to those people who have money in DAFs and being like, hey, you know, you can actually just send this to us and cut out these additional steps to make sure that they actually have urgency on an annual basis to actually that transaction. They're not just parking it in DAFs and then making these uh, grants when it's convenient. Yeah, I love thinking about it in that way. Yeah, no, that's all. that's all really great stuff. Um, so let's kind of set the stage, I'd say a little bit for the crypto piece, um, similar to stocks, it's a massive overall market size in terms of how much capital is invested in it. Massive user base, uh, crypto in the U S is uh, 60 million plus internationally and beyond it's hundreds of millions of users. Um, but only 69, uh, million, let's say donated through the giving block in 2021 last year, it was like 52 million. Um, donate through the giving block specifically. So you're seeing, you know, call it around maybe last year across all uh, platforms and DAFs and everything else, maybe half a billion dollars in charitable giving and an overall $1 trillion gift uh, or market size. Uh, huge average gifts, huge tax incentive, but charities aren't asking for it. Younger investors aren't working with advisors to direct it this way. They have a huge incentive to give crypto or stocks over their cash gifts because they don't pay capital gains. When they make these donations, it's their most tax optimized giving method. And it's still happening at a relatively low rate. So despite the fact that the vast majority of America's top charities are fundraising crypto and of course fundraising stocks, there's still an enormous opportunity um, for people to ultimately be giving more. It's a big average gift size because there is this tax incentive, but donors aren't as educated as they should be on it. And they're not getting asked for it enough. Um, even on the stock front, right? You see $100 billion being donated in stocks with a $46 trillion market size. That number could, of course, be significantly higher. If you ask anybody under the age of 40 in particular who does not work with an advisor, it requires a lot of education. A lot of our donation volume comes from campaigns where we not just ask for crypto, but we do educational campaigns around this tax incentive. We work with crypto tax software providers, work directly with the platforms where they invest. We bring donor communities together around fundraising campaigns. All of these things activate what are kind of latent uh, crypto donors um, who just aren't aware of the fact that their investment methods can ultimately be donation methods. So lots of giving happening out there um, on an annual basis. That 69 is just uh, the giving blocks, uh, giving volume across charities outside of any other kind of DAF and other platform work we do. Um, there's no reason that crypto shouldn't be a multi-billion dollar giving method on an annual basis than for stocks like we just saw in the uh, survey here, 
when half of charities aren't even actively fundraising this stuff, then that $100 billion number is, of course, lower than it ought to be. Yeah, absolutely. I think those numbers are staggering, especially the average gift size. Like, it's just crazy. It is. It's, it's when you look at the, the bridge for, for young donors to be moved from individual giving into major giving, like one of the biggest ways to do that, of course, is to ask for non-cash assets because they can give you a hundred bucks, you know, a year, 10 bucks a month, whatever it is they're doing. There is no urgency set on that. Every single year, if they're an asset donor, they have a tax deadline on that last day of the year. And if they don't issue that non-cash donation to the charity, they're going to have to pay tax on the assets that they sell. So every single year you have this serious urgency for a young donor to consider a major gift that they otherwise wouldn't. And they think about their philanthropic giving as something that happens five, 10, 15 years from now. If their Tesla stock booms in a particular year in 2021, when the crypto is booming, or even in a year where crypto is down like this year, there's still tens of millions of users in the US where some crypto they've invested in is still up, which we'll talk about when we look at the charts. If they're pushed to make that decision, and I don't mean push like pressured, but they consider it as part of their tax strategy on an annual basis and part of their support with you. It's one of the best ways to get someone who's giving 10 bucks a month and thinking of their philanthropic journey as something that happens a decade from now to force themselves into that decision on an annual basis, ultimately upgrading from a individual giving donor to a mid major, et cetera. Yeah. And when you think about younger, young, these younger individuals who are trading stock and trading, trading crypto are frequently not doing that in their retirement accounts. They're doing it in their cap, their cash accounts, which means they have that capital gain. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that where the older generation, if you're asking for them, the urgency to your point, isn't there as much because they don't, they're not going to have to pay capital gains on it because it's, it's already, they've, it's, it's a retirement account or it's in some place where th they're not going to have that same liability. And so that younger, that younger donor, there's an, there's an incentive from a tax perspective um, to, 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 to do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. That's a really good point. Um, and it definitely varies by age. So on um, the traditional online giving front, Dawn, this is something I feel like you could definitely speak to more. Yeah. So, you know, obviously this data is pretty much uh, has been staying about the same for multiple years now, but most of us know the average donor in a tr uh, for traditional online giving is about 65 years old. The average online donation amount is about $200. So again, looking at that prior, that prior screen with the average gift amount versus what the average online donation is, I mean, it's just such a significant difference. And the median donation amount um, for gifts below $1,000 was actually quite low um, at, at, at $20. And when we think about times like right now when inflationary and, and re recession proofing um, your, your, your fundraising strategy, um, crypto and non-cash donations, again, in this way, uh, it should be a big focus. And here's the reason why. Um, these donors are fixed income donors for the most part. These donors are living on Social Security and potentially, you know, in, in, in uh, retirement accounts that they've saved money in. They are impacted by inflation at a much higher percentage than an individual who is not on a fixed income. And so this is where that shrinking is happening is in this group. And so by identifying other ways and other people who might not be suffering from inflation the same way, to recoup and build out that, that pipeline of, of donors across your organization becomes critically important. And again, you know, recession proofing your fundraising to me, I'm always like, you know, we're always on this where we're raising a bunch of money and there's no recession, times are good and everything's, and we're not doing, we're not doing any evaluation. And then times get really bad. And all of a sudden we're trying to, to fill in the gaps to talk to all those donors we didn't talk to when we were so busy because times were good and, and, and trying to rebuild these relationships an ongoing strategy that's consistent is really going to help you over time recession-proof your nonprofit all of the time so that you're not trying to fill in, fill in the gaps when times are bad and then riding high when times are good and then filling in the gaps when times are bad again. Well, let's, let's, let's think of a strategy that keeps us consistent across the board. I love that. The consistency is a super key variable too, not just in terms of like individual giving, but non-cash also. There's a, a comment here in the chat that I'll just hit on quickly off of the consistency component um, where Holly was saying that stock giving is down in a year where the market is down. 
Um, stock giving crypto giving non-cash um, goes up and down with the markets for sure. Not every investor is um, up at the same time, right? Some investors buy at the top of a, a bubble, like what happened in crypto, and then they lose some money. Some investors were buying crypto three years ago when it was still worth much less than it is today. Um, some percentage of this user base is uh, viable as a donor, but what we always say to people is like, if there's 60 million users in the US in 2021, right at the peak of that bull market, practically 100% of those users have an incentive to give crypto. Um, when you're in a bear market and the market is down, more than half of those people, right, like bought crypto at some point that was still lower than today's price. They weren't all buying for the first time at the top of that market. So if a 60 million uh, person potential donor base that you can tap into is worth tapping into on an annual basis, like it's still definitely worth to tap into a donor base that's half that size. You know, it's still uh, an opportunity. It might be not as big as the year before. It doesn't grow in a linear fashion, but the nonprofits who ask for these donations on an annual basis, some will be up some years, some will be down other years. It's important to just repeat the exposure consistently. Well, and, and, and to your point, Pat, you and I were talking before we began the webinar, and we actually did a similar webinar last year at almost the exact same time. And crypto last year on July 14th, which was the day that we um, did the webinar last year, was $20,587. When we jumped, right before we jumped on today, it was it was closing in on 29000 So timing a market is not like the walk the takeaway for me on this is is that you shouldn't be trying to time a market for when you're raising money in these ways you just need to take action and do it because at some point you're going to be at the right time in the market other times you're not going to be at the right uh, time in the market but if you're consistently sharing uh with your non with your with your donors that you're accepting this then you'll be time then you'll time the market right when the market actually does convert 100%. The the consideration stage we talk about with asset giving is so important. Like they need to be seeing these options way in advance of when they're actually making the gift, right? Because like they're setting up DAF accounts otherwise, or other charities have already asked, they've saved some wallet, they've white listed like on their account, but they're going to send that donation to when the market is hot. Um, and then donors who give in certain years when it's up, like when the market is down, lots of nonprofits, save the children as we always use as our Hallmark example, like they've been making crypto for close to a decade at this point. Um, they're one of the biggest organizations we work with. They do a really good job stewarding in down markets. So they get these donors to connect them with folks. You know, they look at NFT artists who are running fundraisers for them. They, they get intro to people. They bring them together for conversations. They ultimately ask them to do things like, hey, crypto is down. But when Bitcoin returns back to, say, $25,000 a unit, would you be willing to fulfill part of your pledge then? They find those price points that work, they get commitments, and then ultimately those donors end up giving. Um, so that's a super important point. The, the stewardship process in up and down markets is key. The nonprofits who show up when the market returns are always, uh, I think, a little disappointed because they're trying to, A, get good at asking for it all at once, figure out how to communicate tax incentives, talk to these donors, where they are, what campaigns are important how to get match dollars, partners, et cetera. And it's tough to get really good at something super fast. And then B, a lot of these donors have already formed relationships when it was quiet because it's less busy. You know, nonprofits are forming a lot more meaningful connections when the market's down. Um, we can hit on the giving by generation real quick too. Uh, across all of these demographics, people invest, of course. Don hit on a really important point. Older donors tend to have a lot of their uh, investments tied up in retirement accounts, it was a more, um, it was more common kind of as they build their wealth. Uh, historically, it doesn't mean that they don't invest very similar to what we'll say about crypto. A lot of our biggest crypto donations come from people over the age of 60, just because they are high net worth. It doesn't mean a higher percentage of people who are over 60 have crypto it just means the ones who do tend to have uh, a pretty decent amount just because they had more money to invest to begin with. Um, older donors, same thing in terms of being asked for assets. They're not going to as likely, they won't be as likely to be day traders, they won't be as likely to have an actively managed portfolio, they won't be as likely to have crypto, but when they hit, it's massive because they tend to have a lot more money. So it's important to make sure they're exposed to the option. It, you just wouldn't want to run like a donate crypto campaign and then segment your donor base for 60 and above and like hammer them with active appeals, right? It's just more of a strategy decision. Um, and then when you look at those uh, Gen X, Millennials and Gen Zs in particular, I think it was in 2019 uh, is when it passed 80% of millennial millionaires were crypto investors. 
Um, now it's north of 90% of millennial millionaires are crypto investors, Gen Zs and millennials. They have crypto, they have stocks, um, and they need to be actively asked for just because they're not working with the advisors who used to direct them into those DAF accounts or direct them to send those assets directly to a charity. Um, how their investing fits in with their philanthropic decision-making, those nodes are not connected by the traditional infrastructure of investors and advisors. So it is more up to nonprofits to ask their younger donors for these giving options and uh, you know provide a few snippets of education on what those tax incentives might mean, even if it's just a, a link to someone like a Fidelity explaining it. Um, Dawn, is there anything, I guess, on the demographics? No, I just, the only other thing we would say is what we're, what we're seeing is, is that millennial and Gen Z in particularly are probably um, more philanthropic. They have more philanthropic tendencies than um, the older generations do. That does not mean that they are giving more, but what it means is, is that they are, they are interested in helping community in a way that, uh, that the older generation from a very young age, they're very interested in whether it's whether it's volunteering or actively understanding the community, the different um, charities in their community and what it's doing. Um, so, so engaging these donors now, when you look at it, it's it's again filling out that pipeline. So, fifty one percent of uh, millennials give. Well, seventy eight percent of what we are calling matures give. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you've got fifty one percent of millennials giving, and you and you and, and you engage them and build a relationship with them, that percentage as they age is going to go up considerably. So again, whether it's recession proofing or just providing a consistency within your fundraising program, focusing on this younger generation can become critically important for doing that. I completely agree. They have to be yeah, ultimately upgraded, right? There's so yeah. many nonprofits who are just asking younger donors for 10 bucks a month because it seems like the thing that works the most than asking older donors for this other stuff, that bridge is ultimately not getting crossed. If it does, that's when you think about it, the average age of millionaires has gone down every couple of years that they measure it for the last decade plus, average donor age is going up. Those two things should be happening at the same time, right? It's not that the average age of millionaires is going up. It's not that older people are aggregating um, a higher percentage of wealth on a per person basis, a small number of people, obviously, of course, pre great wealth transfer have a lot of that capital. There's a lot of young millionaires, right? You would think that the average donor would be getting uh, younger uh, just on a per donation basis versus volume, but that means they're not transitioning into these uh, major gifts at the same rate. So something's broken in the strategy. And if you look at things like the poll we just looked at, if a lot of nonprofits aren't taking any of the main ways that they invest, like their most tax optimized options, you can see why so many donors either turn to DAFs or never incorporate philanthropy into their tax and, and uh, wealth planning at all. Yeah, and there's just so much money sitting on the sidelines to your point earlier about donor advised funds. It's like, it's crazy. And there's it's no so incentive. Much. Yeah, there, you, have, you have to create an incentive from your from your nonprofit, um, a, a, a reason for a sense of urgency to give now versus 10 years from now. I completely agree. This is uh, a thing we can talk about when we get into strategies kind of at the end too. Like for assets in particular, using match dollars for these types of gifts to try to get younger donors to come out of the woodwork and give these types of gifts for the first time because it's such a sticky way to give because it's such a good opportunity to upgrade these younger donors into these mid and major donors that are more recession and future proof to grow relationships. Using match dollars specifically when you get them from a partner or a donor, whoever it might be, to encourage asset type giving and the Dawn's point about urgency to encourage people to actually issue those grants out of their DAFs because there is no urgency once they have it in there, they've already gotten the tax incentive. It creates a lot of urgency when they've got $100,000 sitting in the DAF account and someone says they'll match it if you send it right now. Like suddenly people are gonna, and then if you also give them this option where they can do it right in your donation form, they can just click where they have the account and it just pulls it into the overlay and they can just click issue the grant and it's done and they're getting it matched. Like it's a great way to start extracting these DAF dollars and 80% of those dollars, 250 billion, is sitting on the sideline and there is no other urgency being created. So match uh, dollars in addition to active appeals are like such a powerful tool to get younger and older donors alike to actually issue these grants. Yeah, creating a sense of urgency in a frictionless experience equals donations. Yeah, boom, that's better. You should write our copy, Dawn. <laughs> um, so we hit on this and we'll, we'll roll into the crypto piece. And, and actually give kind of some some market overview, but 
larger average gift size and people give non-cash assets. So you don't have to push people to give any way they don't want to give, but it's very important. Most owners are not exposed to these other options. When you give them exposure to the fact that they can give crypto stocks or a DAF grant, the odds of their average gift size going up is incredibly high. So getting younger donors into that and all donors into this consideration stage for giving you their assets so that they don't end up parking in a DAF and letting it sit or never consider it at all is so incredibly key. It's one of the biggest tools in your toolbox to get a donor to give you a gift that's above the average gift size. And when you think about it, what we've talked about before, just real quick on that, is, is that we, when you look at the stock and the and and the crypto, most will give in both. Like the 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 data says they're giving in both. So that's six thousand or sixty five hundred in crypto and five thousand in stock. Now we're looking at compounding that because really they potentially are giving in uh, with both vehicles. Yep. Some years they actually give a little of both because they had they want to give a hundred grand and they have sixty k in really appreciated crypto and forty k in really appreciated stocks. So they'll put those two together. And then some donors, of course, like Tesla went up a bunch one year and they gave that. And then the next year they were giving Bitcoin because of the boom in that market. Um, donors are moving between these assets. A crypto donor or stock donor are not necessarily separate demographics. It's important to give them all of their non-cash options and then the DAF option if they've already parked it somewhere and then extract it according to what's most uh, suitable for the donor. Um, so we've hit on this a bunch. Young donors tend to have both. Um, the average age of people opening stock brokerage accounts is going down. Um, Average age of millionaires going down, uh, crypto investors, 94% uh, are millennials and Gen Zs. Um, and then you look at millennial millionaires who have crypto, 90% um, of the people in the millennial age demographic who are millionaires are crypto traders at this point. It's a massive demographic. Um, so it's really important, A, that the nonprofit accepts it, and then B, that the donor is exposed repeatedly throughout the year to the fact this is an option. Again, we always say you don't have to run a crypto campaign. You don't have to email your whole donor base and say, send crypto now. You don't have to set a time deadline. Keep exposing them to the option all throughout the year, right? And then when you have match dollars, when you have an end of year campaign, a tax deadline, or the market, it's a certain point. You have these opportunities to ultimately ask them to send gifts that are a bit more time cap. Um, uh, and this is, yeah, the tax efficiency piece. So we, we didn't hit it at the beginning, but just to reiterate for those who don't know, when a donor gives you cash, um, the reason that donors uh, choose to give non-cash assets rather than that is because they don't pay capital gains on the assets that they donate. So I'll give you like a tax arbitrage example. This is also why so many young donors aren't aware of this. They don't work with an advisor. If I have a million dollars in Bitcoin, a million dollars in cash, and I want to send a donation to a charity, if I send them the million dollars that I have sitting in my bank account, the charity will get a million dollars and I'll get a million dollar write-off, which is a huge tax advantage. That's pretty good as is. And I still have my million dollars in Bitcoin, right? Which is what I'd like to actively invest in. If the donor, on the other hand, gives you the million dollars in Bitcoin, something different happens. You get the million dollars as the charity, they get the million dollar write-off, but the difference now is that million dollars they had in Bitcoin that they ultimately would have had to pay the US government and the state government capital gains tax on, the appreciation from whenever they bought it to whenever they give it, they no longer owe those taxes at all. So let's say they bought it at a low price and now they've given it to you. Let's say they owe state and federal cap gains of 20% total. That would be $200,000 they would have had to give the federal government when they sold those assets. So what they can do now is give you the full million dollar value of those assets without ever paying that 200 grand. They put 200 grand pretty much back in their pocket. They get that full write off of the million dollars. And what they can then do if they want, they can take the million dollars they have in their bank account and they can buy crypto today. It's at today's cost basis. So it hasn't appreciated at all. And now they're sitting on the same million dollars they could have been sitting on if they gave you the cash, but $200 in tax burden has just evaporated. So when you think about high net worth donors in particular, it's a massive tax incentive to make sure that they can give you these assets directly. Because if they're giving you that cash, the million dollars they had in Bitcoin, whenever they decide to spend it or use it at some point in the future, they're going to have to give the government 200 grand. So it's in effect worth $800,000 if they choose to give the other way. Um, Pat, the other yeah. way I like to think about it is, okay, your donor has a, a million dollars in in crypto and they decide they want to be philanthropic and give that million dollars. They don't know the ta tax ramifications. And so they cash out that donation before they ever, or they cash out that crypto before they ever give you the donation. That's now reduced to eight, 700 or 800,000, depending on what their capital gains um, uh, percentage is at, right? So now that million dollars that you were going to receive as an organization is only 700 or 800,000. If they know 
hey, I can give this million dollars, the organization's going to get the million dollars, and I still get that same tax, I, I don't, I get that tax relief, that you get the full million dollars. So as a nonprofit, making sure that you're, that these, that these donors understand that and know that can make a huge difference in how much money you raise for the, from them. It's, it's a massive point. Um, and, a, and a further risk on that, to your point, if they understand the tax incentive, but they don't know they can give it to you directly, to your point, they'll put the 200 grand aside and give you 800 instead because they need to save that money for their tax bill. They just reduce their gift size. The other thing is if the nonprofits don't accept it directly, which we've seen, which is like horror show type stuff, where nonprofits will be like, oh, there's a tax incentive to give crypto, but we don't accept it directly because they choose not to. And they'll tell the donor, why don't you just sell it and give us the cash? And the donor doesn't know about this. And then the donor gets a knock and hey, you owe the IRS $200,000 because of what a nonprofit just instructed you to do. You think about like how valuable these non-cash relationships are. It's so important that the nonprofits, of course, be educated on this and then also have the tools to accept it directly to avoid those sorts of things from happening. Because that has happened in the past where nonprofits will explicitly tell a crypto user to sell their crypto and give them the cash because they don't want to take it directly. And then they just bury someone who was like a very high value donor with a tax bill because of their direct instructions. So really important that you accept these things directly. Well, another thing is just just to, to that point also is, is that if you're even using something like the giving block, you're not accepting crypto. You're not taking crypto and having to do something with it. And I think that's the fear that a lot of nonprofits have is that I don't know anything about crypto. I don't know when the right time to sell it is or whatever the case may be. So I don't want to do it. And the reality is, is that with the giving block, you're not doing that. You're most likely not doing that anyways, unless you've got somebody on staff who's like excellent with crypto. 100%. Um, if you're, I'm just answering a, a question um, in the chat about the recording. And then to your point, just to reiterate on all of this, the solutions, if you're taking crypto stocks, the FGFs through the giving block, those assets are immediately liquidated. In crypto in particular, more than stocks, what's funny is nonprofits are concerned about crypto volatility, um, which we'll kind of get into. Um, crypto is the only one of those that's immediately liquidated because uh, stocks involve the whole brokerage process. They're so much less efficient and they're not 24 hour markets. So if you get it on a weekend, whenever the transfer is initiated, there's days in between uh, sometimes where there actually can be price volatility. There's volatility for traders of crypto, right? Because they're holding it over that time period. But the, the second they decide to send it to the charity, it hits an account and is immediately liquidated, just sold on an exchange account. And the nonprofit's just getting US dollars to their bank account. So if a nonprofit doesn't want to hold crypto, which is the vast, vast majority of the time, same thing with stocks and everything else, there's no downside risk or volatility concerns around it. It's immediately liquidated as a part of the tools. So you're not just accepting the gift and holding it. It's sold for cash. Um, I'll, I'll hit on uh, a couple of these things. I think it's really good that we unpacked a lot of that uh, context at the beginning here. Some of these things we can rip through pretty quickly because they're relatively point blank, just things that a lot of people aren't aware of. If you look at the end of last year, for instance, Bitcoin was around $18,000 a unit. Today, I'd have to look. I think it's closer to $30,000 a unit after the, the ETF news. Um, Bitcoin and Ethereum on the year are outperforming every other asset class. Um, also important to note, even though Bitcoin was at its peak uh, in 2021 worth se almost $70,000 a unit, even today in the 20s of thousands of dollars per unit of Bitcoin, it's outperformed every other asset class over the last decade. So cryptocurrencies, despite all of this market volatility, are outperforming every other asset. The way you can think about it is some assets go up steadily. You know, you have a bond that's giving you a yield of a couple percent. Some stocks go up an average of 7.5% a year. Cryptocurrencies have these really big booms, right? And then they have these down markets and there's more volatility than you'd see in the stock market. But over any multi-year period, we'll show the, the graph in a second here, um, the average investor is actually up more than they are down. So you can think about if you put a dollar in, it becomes $10 and then that cuts in half. The cut in half part sounds kind of scary, but you started with the dollar and you end up with five. Now this is not investment advice. It doesn't mean it'll always go up this way. It just means for the people who've been investing in this stuff for now over a decade, I think for Bitcoin, it's 15 years. Um, the odds of these people having bought crypto just at the top of that bubble and not holding any crypto that's actually appreciated and therefore tax incentivized to give to a charity, it's incredibly low. Tax incentives are always better, the higher the price, of course, but there's a lot of people buying crypto for a long time. And despite that volatility, it's outperforming literally everything else. Yeah. This is the chart here. A lot of people you know, talk about, again, like the, the crypto crash. 
you can see the history of cryptocurrency over this time. Um, all of the green areas lit up are days that the value of crypto is lower than it is today. So yes, it's down from that window where the market was really, really booming. Um, but you can see that this is a very small snapshot in what is a long history of tens of millions of people investing in this stuff in the US. And some of the crypto they bought here is probably down, but a lot of people bought crypto that they're holding from any timeline here. And then since that crash, right, this whole way down, people have continued to buy and invest in crypto. The total number of users has gone up. And this is a large reason why um, when nonprofits were kind of caught off guard that last year was our best crypto fund or second best crypto fundraising year versus the bull market. And we actually did better than even the year leading up to the bull market where prices were appreciating. How can there be more giving? Um, ultimately, people are buying this stuff over a long timeline. Not everyone loses money or gains money in any particular year. Bull markets are, yes, of course, the best years to fundraise crypto. But in any calendar year, people have this stuff and they've been buying it for a very long time. So the why crypto now component, this is, I think a lot of people coming to this presentation are looking for this type of data. Volatility and appreciation, um, that should be singular, but um, the volatility piece for investors versus the volatility piece for nonprofits is a very different value proposition. For investors, it can be risky, right? Risk reward ratio is there. For nonprofits, you actually want volatility because volatility means depreciation and appreciation. If an asset stays flat or appreciates a little bit, there's not that much tax burden, right, for the individuals who bought it. Versus if you see an asset that just keeps bouncing between really high highs and really low lows, some people are buying at the bottom. Now, some people lose money, some people make money, but the important part is some people make a lot of money, right? Someone bought something at a rate that is much lower than it is today. Even if some people lose money, that volatility in the crypto ecosystem has actually led to a higher percentage of people actively trading it and a higher percentage of people actively giving it. To the point where we looked at the user base of stocks, there's much more people with stocks than crypto. If you go onto the internet and you look for Google searches that involve donate crypto or donate stocks, they've actually already reached parity because of things Don talked about. Crypto donors are younger, they're more digitally native, they're actively trading it, moving into and out of positions, they're thinking about the tax considerations. And because of this price volatility, even if some of their cryptos are down, if any one of the cryptos they invested in went up a lot, that's their most uh, valuable donation method. They get to write off the most taxes when they give the thing that went up the most. So volatility from a fundraising standpoint is actually fantastic. It drives these upward and down movements that ultimately drive the giving. Um, increased generosity is a really good, important point here. Some of this is because they're younger and mission oriented, of course, but a large percentage of this actually goes back to the volatility. Because people are actively engaging with crypto, they're treating it as something that they actually play with versus some of these older um, donors who have money sitting in a, a retirement account. They don't look at that as money. They don't look at something they interface with. They wouldn't even think about it as something they can send to other people. It's really something that sits. The active engagement around crypto and NFTs means the odds of these individuals thinking about it as something they can transfer to a charity could be high so long as the charities ask for it. So in short, um, younger donors uh, are engaging with it more. And because the market has outperformed the other markets, people are more incentivized to give this way. So crypto is given at a higher rate and a higher edge gift size uh, just because of the um, that volatility. And then the new young and wealthy we hit on, um, a high percentage of crypto users are of course on the younger side, high net worth younger people, of course, at crypto at a really staggering rate. Uh, but something we always point to is half of crypto wealth is actually held by Gen X people and above, just because a lot of these um, venture funds and uh, wealth management firms, people who are uh, managing great deals of money or high net worth individuals even a very small diversification into crypto, if you're a billionaire, can obviously be a lot of money and they just tend to have a little bit more. So we point to this young donor demographic because when we get to this great wealth transfer, it's going into the hands of people who at a staggering rate invest in cryptocurrency, invest in stocks, crypto in particular though. So the more money that gets handed to this, these younger generations, the more we can expect them to invest in crypto and ultimately give it. Yep. Tax education we hit on, great wealth transfer we hit on, which is awesome. I think we're all through this. We can go right into crypto donor demographics. So who are crypto donors? Um, the generosity piece we hit on, um, donating $1,000 or more, 45%. I think in stocks, that's low 30s. 45% um, of the users on Fidelity, when they ran this poll, give $1,000 or more to charity. 
if they ticked the crypto box, if they didn't tick that they invest in crypto, their numbers went down substantially. So people are making a bunch of money in crypto. That's probably a big driver, but they're also kind of young, impact oriented. They're in this cutting edge technology. They probably have some uh, need to or interest in changing the world. Young individuals, the average wealth of a crypto user is higher than the average wealth of any city in America. So the average income in, say, San Francisco or the Bay Area, for instance, is still slightly lower than if you took all the crypto users and you put them in a city, it would be the wealthiest city in America. Very high net worth, very young, higher propensity to give, large average gift size. You look across those statistics, it's pretty compelling data set. I don't know, Dawn, just because you, you're so much deeper into the data side, if there's anything on this. Yeah. I mean, one of the other things about the crypto donors, if you can identify those donors that look like crypto donors and get them to give a, a crypto do gift, or even just make an assumption that they probably are, are holding some crypto and might be a donor in the future, this is really entering like mid to major. They enter your, 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 your giving pyramid at a much higher level than your traditional first time giver because the, because of that wealth of them and because of the generosity that they have um it, it can fuel a mid major program in a way that just going after average donations can't so we are trying to identify more of those crypto donors um and those crypto pros, pr pr prospective donors so that you in, so that the nonprofit actually engages them different from the very beginning yeah 100% um Okay, so we we hit on I, th I think we we hit on a great deal of this. Don, you yeah, in particular, um, yeah, wealthy donors in general. If you're trying to get high net worth donors over time. It's becoming more and more necessary, and these investments that people are making in crypto donors, of course, just when you look at that demographic information, is amazing for future proofing, especially a major gifts program and ultimately a nonprofit's budget overall. Caring about young donors, like a gateway into the organization, it's essential just because it's not just the way they invest, but it's a big part of their community, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of people, they're on these Reddit forums, they're in Discord channels, they're investing in NFTs, they're creating art, they're connecting around this technology in the same way that you see all of this buzz around, uh, you know, chat GPT. Crypto is not just a mode of investment, but it's ultimately like a, a community. And one that can be tapped into and ultimately leveraged. If you want young donors to want to engage with your content, something we always point to is the press releases we do with charities that are just announcing that they take crypto or something beyond that. Any crypto related press release, we could be a big gift, a match, announce that they take it. Um, crypto press releases, except for one nonprofit we worked with um, who had a really big research breakthrough that year. Every other crypto press release we've ever done has been the best performing press release that the charity had that year. Um, and that's across all of space and time. So when you think about the fact that it's just fundamentally interesting and engaging, especially for younger people, giving them opportunities to give you cryptocurrency, not once through a press release, but consistently across space and time is a great way to just open a wider door for younger people to want to give to you in a way they find fun and engaging to begin with. And it makes your content, of course, more compelling. Now, you don't want to lose your roots and just start talking about crypto all the time, but it's definitely a reason for someone who's in a younger donor demographic to consider your organization to be a bit more innovative or interesting um, compared to traditional content. Um, and then we talked about the desirability. That's just those donor demographics, right? These are young people, they're high net worth, they give at a super high rate. And that market volatility drives really huge surges of giving activity. Love it. Cool. So what do crypto donors value? Um, transparency is one piece. So this is not all crypto donors, but you can start forming a collage, right? Of what people might care about. Nonprofits who care about transparency, blockchain, the technology behind crypto has created the most transparent form of money that's ever existed. You can follow those ledgers, right? So when nonprofits have transparency alignment, that can be a great way to create a story. Innovation, of course, is important. Nonprofits who are interested in innovative technologies, who are doing innovative things, when you combine that with crypto, you probably have audience overlap as is. So it's a great opportunity to open the doors to that donor demographic and the method they might want to give, right? You're, you're doing something in advanced robotics or machine learning. There's probably a lot of people in your community who have crypto, right? These are good kind of indicators to think about. Decentralization, anonymity, this is a huge one. Um, anonymous crypto gifts are optional for nonprofits, right? You can have a donor fill out a form before they get a wallet. I know a lot of nonprofits are concerned about this. What if I don't want to accept anonymous gifts? The answer is you don't have to. So a lot of nonprofits do accept anonymous gifts because they're very traceable. The exchanges block things like blacklisted wallet addresses, they share information just like any other bank account. 
Um, it's, it's as safe as any other donation method to accept these anonymously, but totally up to you as a charity. And it can be a thing that of course can be a signal to the community. Global access, clear and concise ROI. Um, these are things that I think matter to, to all donors, but crypto donors in particular. Okay, and then two personas uh, that we can run through. And then of, of course, for everyone who's on the line here, um, a, if you have Q&A questions, pop those in to make sure that we can hit on some of these at the end. I'm able to hang on for a few minutes also at the end of our time, Don, if you've got yeah. that too. Yeah, um, yeah. Pop those questions in the Q&A. We'll, we'll hang on and run through those. Anything we don't get to, we'll give back to you all in writing, right? Put those in a document to get you guys answer. So make sure you get all those questions in. Um, and then at the end, we'll give you all um, QR codes in a minute here where you can download the annual report on crypto and then the, the report from giving DNA to unpack some of this data. Um, but quickly on the crypto donor personas, crypto enthusiasts versus optimistic investors. Crypto enthusiasts, like we just talked about, they like cryptocurrency, it's their community, it's the content they consume, maybe they're into something like NFTs. If you are an arts related organization, right, where you've crossed over a mission alignment, if you are a human rights and empowerment organization where you care about things like privacy rights, right, you have mission alignment. These crypto enthusiasts, if you are technologically advanced, if you're aligned with their mission and values, if you have a younger donor demographic, this is where the enthusiasm piece can come in. It can be great for building a community, it can be great for getting attention, it can be great for converting younger donors, retaining them, keeping them engaged. On the other side of this fence are investors. There are lots of people who give crypto simply because of the tax incentive, right? They're investing in crypto, it's where they put their capital. It's just, frankly, their most tax optimized way to give. You do not have to be a crypto enthusiastic organization in order to fundraise crypto effectively, especially if you have something like an older donor base um, or just a lack of mission alignment. You do not have to reinvent the wheel and run a crypto fundraiser, repeated exposure to the giving option and ultimately pulling donors out of the woodwork who frankly have a tax incentive to give so. Um, that can be more than enough and it, it largely depends on your donor demographics and how you fundraise. Okay. Some digital donor behavior, which is important. Giving without knowing you um, is an important one. This is largely still just based on people Googling, where can I donate crypto? Our platform at The Giving Block has grown. It's a kind of a hybrid crowdfunding platform almost because so many people just Google what charities will take this stuff because nonprofits don't present this option very frequently. Um, not knowing the organization, looking for something that's relatively mission aligned, you not knowing them, them not knowing you. This is really if you have anonymous giving options or if you're not actively promoting it. Um, doing the research online don't necessarily require any in-person or direct conversation. A lot of this is kind of the younger donor demographic stuff in general. Motivated by a sense of urgency when there's a tax incentive to do so, this is why it's really important to not wait until there's a market dynamic or reason to give. They will have discovered these options, they'll have a game plan or you'll have to educate them from scratch if they don't have those things. And it's really hard to do that in a matter of weeks, right? You want your donors exposed to the option, considering it. And then when that moment hits that they want to give this way, they not only know who they're giving to, but how they're going to give it. And they've got it all lined up, right? You want to lock those gifts in well in advance, just through repeated passive exposure to the fact that it's an option. Um, many are first time donors to the organization. This is why it's so important to take it. For a lot of these investors, you are frankly off the menu if you don't take crypto. If I am gonna have to pay 200 grand in capital gains taxes, if this charity doesn't take my crypto gift, I'm not gonna send the bank transfer instead. There's just too much on the line when there's that much tax advantage built into it. So a lot of donors are just making their giving decisions, unfortunately, based on who takes it and who takes it the right way. If you're trying to get on a phone call and giving brokerage instructions, like it's really hard to give this way or I just don't see the option. I'm going to go on Google. I'm going to find a way to give this because I'm going to make sure this gift gets in before the tax deadline. I'm not giving this 200 grand to the IRS. I'm giving it to a charity. Um, anonymous gifts we touched on. The vast majority of giving volume in crypto is actually from donors who give their information. The larger the gift size from the donor, the more likely they are to leave that data behind. So again, if you want to take anonymous donations, you definitely can. Most do. Lots of charities choose not to take anonymous donations and instead collect more information, but potentially lose some of those anonymous donors. Totally up to well, the organization, they, comfort levels. Yeah. And when you think about it, the reason why if somebody's giving you a thousand dollars, they're going to want a tax write off anyways. And they can only get a tax write off if they give you the, their data so that they can get the tax write off. Right. And so, you know, those one dollar, two dollar gifts, they can be anonymous. But the larger, to your point, the larger that gift size, there's there's a reason for that donor not to give anonymously. Yeah. 
no, definitely. That's a huge point about the, the actual tax uh, receipt, which is automatically generated by the given block software, FYI. Um, and then of course, so we talked about this, appreciation, gratitude, um, and then the tax advantage here. So we have engaging with crypto donors. I think I wanna just take one second to make sure we hit on your questions that you have in the Q&A. I see one in the chat, we'll hit on those. Um, and then with the remaining time, I think we can run up until like 2.15. Dawn, if you've got it, people have the ability to hang on. Um, yeah, let's make it. sure. That way we can, awesome. yeah, we're gonna share this out anyway. So if anybody has to jump, they can just listen to the last 15 minutes or so. That's great. And, and make sure even if you do have to jump, get those questions in the Q&A because we're gonna provide written follow-up for anything we don't get to. Um, we have a great question in the Q&A. So 70% uh, of our donor base is boomer and silent generations. Um, tried acquisition mailing. Uh, I think it's fair to say it didn't work. We're a community-based nonprofit. How do we get the attention of crypto younger donors? So this is a great one. Kind of goes into engaging with crypto donors. This comes down to engagement and kind of making a decision as an organization. So if you have um, mostly older donors and that's your strategy, sometimes a nonprofit has mostly older donors, but they're getting new older donors in consistently. They just tend to serve that demographic. It could be mission alignment. People only get into that issue at a certain age. You actually have a sustainable older donor demographic strategy. In those cases, you don't want to be crypto first. I think it's great to have it as an option, but you don't need this really aggressive strategy. If you're not trying to build a younger donor base point blank period, if you're not trying to build that following, accept new gifts, kind of change that average um, donor age downward. Um, if it's not in keeping with a broader strategy, it can be a bit of a distraction, right? Because maybe these donors, if you're fundraising for mostly boomer silent generations, don't need active crypto appeals. It's maybe not the most efficient strategy. Maybe you need to be stock and DAF giving first, but have crypto there as kind of a backup option, right? Your, your first approach could be like donating non-cash assets, stocks, DAF, et cetera. Here's the crypto option also to make sure you don't miss that because they, of course, might have it. And maybe that's your non-cash approach, right? However, just because you have an older donor demographic doesn't mean you necessarily want to stick with that ratio. If you're trying to build a younger ratio, then it, it gets injected into the same strategies you have already going. If you're building a following on Twitter, if you're building a newsletter for younger donors, younger donor board, right? Um, these are the sorts of opportunities you can bring crypto in more proactively. Um, you don't necessarily need to force the exposure on the older demographic or direct appeals. Crypto should fit where it fits. Stock and Dash should fit where it fits. Uh, Dawn, I'm not sure if you have. Yeah, I would say also, on. it sounds like they're, they're, they're trying to get net new names into their into their file of these younger donors because their file, which is very, very common, skews heavily in an older demographic. Um, you, you can also overlay de um, data from somebody like Giving DNA where we can tell you who are the social influencers that are already in your database. And so those younger people that are already in your database that are social influencers, you can go to that group and ask them to share on their social media feeds things about why they love you as an organization, with the idea being that when somebody follows you on social media, many times their a lot of their opinions are, are, are similar. They like what you have to say, that this is why people are always sharing clothes on Instagram so that someone goes and buys those clothes, because this is what this is this is how this happens. And we, we're seeing clients that are having success with using their social media influencers that are already are fans of their organization to go find new people that normally would not have ever heard of the organization. I love that. That's massive. Yeah. Influencers is great. And then also like ambassadors, kind of yep. in, internal folks. If you don't have the audience pre-existing, right? You don't have a big Twitter following. You're not, you know, posting on Reddit. You, you don't have kind of this direct access. You, you can't kind of skip the line with crypto and just get an immediate following. What you can do for sure, though, is if you have any younger donors, which I'm sure some are in that donor database, you can ask people to help you tap in, right? Who in our audience is into crypto? Who's into NFTs? Who is really big into trading stocks? Whatever else it might be. Like this is becoming a priority for organization. We're getting more into the tech slash this fundraising ecosystem. We need someone uh, to help us expand further. You can also do this with platforms like TikTok, right? There's lots of people who are in school who want this on the resume, whatever it might be. They're expert at it. You don't need your whole team to get really good at a new social media platform, a new giving method, a new technology. You can just ask your audience who's into this and wants to be kind of an ambassador or someone who can help us uh, move into the space. They'll be excited to put together a PowerPoint deck. They'll be excited to reach out to their friends to help you put together some content, 
help you explore it. Um, you can kind of outsource some of that work. And if you have younger people on the team in particular who are into it, they can of course help again with the, the content curation where it's posted and then going out there in the DMs on Twitter, on Reddit, et cetera, and finding donors to pull into the ecosystem. Um, so outsourcing some of that to experts is great. I also think if you're looking for this younger demographic, you have to be consistent in your social media. In your social media, um, a lot of times nonprofits struggle with that piece of it. They're not consistently posting on social media, and that consistency is key. And going back, and when somebody asks a question, you're answering those questions. You're responding to anything that anybody's doing on your social media. It's not just about the original post. It's also about the, the buzz that's being created off of that original post. So if you want to find that younger group, you've got to live where they live and that's where they live. Yeah, I love that. Social media, get that involved. And of course, to be part of a broader, younger donor acquisition strategy, it can't be you know a monolithic pillar. Um, we have another question from, I'm actually, we can dive back into some of these slides. We're kind of talking through some of these strategies. Um, anyway, we have a lot of examples here. We can get to, um, case studies, but I want to make sure that these QR codes are available. If you want to download these reports, we'll run through some of these questions because I know we ran over on time, mostly yeah, Michael. One of, the other, one of the other things that we are hearing success with is um, um, identifying the right crypto donors. And Pat, between you guys and us, we've created um, through using Giving Block data in Giving DNA, where we actually can analyze each of your individual um, constituent files and tell you who looks like good crypto donors between the internal giving information and the external data around age and salary information and are they digitally responsive and those things that we're looking for when it comes to these are data points that are pretty consistent across crypto donors. So we can take a larger file and say, hey, have these you know, 10,000 records you have here are 300 people that look like good crypto donors. What I find a lot, and Pat, you, you may see this too, is I do a lot of research on what do my clients' giving pages look like? So I go and I look at their at their giving pages. And what I find is this frequently, they do have crypto, but it's buried a lot of times. It's like the ninth thing down here at the bottom after plan giving and monthly giving and in memory and all of the other things, crypto is kind of down under the fold, let's say, a lot of times. So somebody doesn't even see it on their website. Um, and even if they do see it on their website, you know, it's not flashing lights, not that we're saying that it should be. But if we can identify, hey, here are 300 people that look like good crypto donors, and then you send them out a direct mail, uh, 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 an email with a link directly to that giving page on the site so that they're not having to find it on their website. Like you're, you're saying, Hey, 300 people that Giving DNA and the Giving Block think are good crypto donors. Let's go and um, ask and, and just send them directly to that page. They don't have to find it on their site. The other thing that we're seeing success with is millennial donors are actually very responsible, responsive to direct mail. But the, 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 the problem is, is that we can't track how they give because they never give through a check, basically. So they get a direct mail piece and then they respond online. And we've heard this over and over again in talking with actual donors that they received a direct mail piece, which was directly part of the reason why they went online and gave a gift. So we're seeing clients do things like add a QR code to the outside of their direct yeah. mail piece for these donors. And by the way, I can tell you who's direct mail responsive of these crypto donors. So I don't send it to everybody. I only send it to the smaller subset. And the QR code goes directly to that page. The beauty with that is, is that now we can give an, uh, 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 we can attribute that gift to that direct mail piece. And so now we're actually tracking what the rates of attribution are better than, oh, well, we sent them direct mail, but they all went online and gave digitally. So, so yeah, yeah, that's another thing that we're seeing. Both of those are very have been very successful. This is, this is massive on like key takeaways for everyone who's still on the line. And we should put this in the email that we follow up with everyone. Like what are actions you can take once you're accepting these gifts kind of point blank period. I'm going to backpedal from some, you, you hit on a bunch of things that are so important and essential. Direct mail as an avenue to get people to give ultimately on your website and through digital means is massively under uh, tracked, right? They're not either not putting the option in there or we're not tracking it. You can have a UTM link, which is just like, a trackable link that goes to an exit. You don't even need to set up a different page. You can have a trackable link that you put as a QR code, right? That people can scan off your direct mail. And you can see who went to that page from your direct mailer, from anything that you put out. You can see which campaign it was. They're very easy to generate. You can just Google UTM link generator. It's free. It just puts a little tracker on it. And then you can see how many people came from that link versus another link. 
that's massive. Have it in there, of course, crypto, stocks, staff giving, and then QR codes to go directly to those options. That's huge. You hit on something right before that also. It needs to be, this is the biggest takeaway for so many people who are trying all these active strategies. Donors need to see this option, A, on the giving pages, right? On your donate page, if there's a menu that says other ways to give, better drop down and show crypto, stocks, staff, like these are options for them. How hard is it to discover that these options exist in the ways they're going on your site? Are they linked back to each other? Um, B, in passive exposure opportunities, if you have just like a donate button on every newsletter or email that goes out, that's not a direct appeal, that doesn't showcase that you have things like Apple Pay, Google Pay on the card side, like digital wallets or crypto stocks, staff giving that they're not going to bump into if they go into a card first tool. Having those icons, having those options there, rotating that through so that they can see that these options exist, repeated passive exposure so that they're considering the fact that these might be a way they want to give, that's huge. And then finally, in the direct appeals, when you're sending something like, to Dawn's point, you've looked at your donor database, you work with giving DNA, you figure out like who could be a crypto donor, have backup options there. This is like a big missed uh, opportunity with crypto. Crypto is a tax optimized mode of giving. So a lot of these people love that you take crypto, want to give crypto eventually, but not right now. Maybe they want to give you a small crypto gift. It's like a little high five, which is an, an indicator of the giving capacity. Maybe they want to give with a card because they're going to do this at the end of year instead, or the asset they want to give, they think will be up next year. And that's when they make their crypto gift. Make sure that you have your other non-cash options first and foremost. It can be a crypto first thing, but like crypto or stock or DAF, right? Give them these other options, whatever investment they want to give. And then also give them traditional methods like a card, right? Because they might look at that appeal, be interested, but ultimately they just want to give it the card right now. Here's a little something while I figure this out, talk to an advisor or figure it out on my own. Give them more ways to give. You don't have to just send a crypto option and send them to that page. Like that's why we added our stock and our DAF option. That's why we have a card as a backup option, even in a non-cash tool. Make sure that you give them those backup options because they might be into crypto, but they're not giving this way right now. Give them another way to convert, right? So even if they look like a high likelihood crypto donor, if they're high likelihood to have crypto, they probably have stocks too. Probably don't have all of their money in crypto. Give them a diverse set of options. Um, yeah, I love that. All of these things we should, yeah, pack just some key takeaways because I think that's huge, Don. I think a lot of people in direct mail in particular, I'm more likely to open if I get it as a letter than if I get it as an email. And I want a QR code. I want to just go in and do it for my phone. I don't want to be told to navigate to a website or a written out URL. The ease of use to actually access and send that transaction on the fly off a piece of mail is huge. And if the nonprofit can track that, then you can actually demonstrate that it's working. So yeah. those are huge takeaways. Um, Let's see, we got one minute here. This is uh, a great question. Has the average gift size gone up from the $10,000 average gift size uh, in 2021? It went down last year to like between six and $7,000 a unit. Still significantly higher than the average gift, but of course, just the level of appreciation and the average offset was just not as big. Um, and then what are your thoughts on the government, the SEC, what's affecting donations to nonprofits? Um, when there's regulatory uncertainty in the moment, you can see donors go into a bit of a holding pattern as they try to figure out what's going to happen next. Um, however, the regulatory changes that are happening currently is something that the sector is craving. I know some people are um, concerned about it. Nonprofits should feel good about it because this is the clarity that platforms need to get external investment. One of the biggest handicaps to the, the, the crypto sector to not growing is the fact that traditional financial institutions aren't willing to bet on it, are willing to put money in. You can already see right, with this ETF, with Fidelity, with Schwab, these investments that are now coming out, these traditional firms that are getting into crypto, it happened within months, right, of the US government saying, we're going to look at this, we're going to regulate it differently, we're going to set guidelines that you all can find predictable and actually play within the, the lines. The lack of regulatory clarity has been one of the biggest hindrances to growth. It definitely has short-term impacts on the price of crypto, but over time, will it mean more users from the traditional financial sector? Yes, of course. And will it mean that you know, crypto philanthropy because of the growth of crypto and traditional investments goes up. I think that's uh, obvious, at least from my side, unless something disastrous and unforeseen happens. That regulatory clarity has been craved for a long time. That's one of the main reasons that crypto investors haven't come from every corner of the sector. People have been waiting for the rules to be more clear cut. And I know on the, for donor advice funds as well, last, I think it was last year, um, a lot of nonprofits were pushing for the rules to change where they cannot have money just sitting, take that, that um, uh, 
um, tax liability off their shoulders by 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 um, pr providing it into their donor advised fund at a particular time, and then it can sit there forever. So they're definitely having conversations around limiting how long that money can sit in there, which I think would be great for nonprofits because it's going to create more of a sense of urgency um, to be able to give that money sooner to the nonprofits that they're earmarking it for. And then it's not just a true tax play; it's actually a phil uh, a philanthropy play, play. So you know, if you're if you're with your local, you know, uh, APRA or whatever, if you hear that they're having conversations around stuff like that, get in there and have conversations, join the, join, join the conversations that other people are having so that the momentum builds on that. I love that. Um, I know we, we ran way over. I want to thank everyone for, for coming today. If you have additional questions, of course, feel free to follow up with us. Uh, a few things here, these annual reports we'll send out to everybody. Strongly encourage everyone here to read both. There's a lot of important data in there for understanding um, the fundraising strategies and, and the, the richer data that Giving DNA looks into. And then of course, at a high level, some crypto data that we impact in our, our annual industry report on crypto philanthropy. Um, B, if you wanna connect with either of our teams for a deeper dive on some of this information, like happy to do, I'm sure Don feels the same way presentations, run through information, kind of arm you and your team with more data so you don't have to go back and like explain Bitcoin to everybody. Um, we're always happy to give presentations to individual organizations and go back to your team so you don't have to, you know, watch this five times and pull together notes. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, yeah, if you want to connect with uh, the Giving Block about like using our solution, you can go to thegivingblock.com. There's an accept button there. Uh, you can connect with uh, an expert on our team. You can run through product demos and all that good stuff. And then Dawn, if they want to connect with you, not about a presentation, but working together, what's the, the best way yeah, to get in touch? Uh, GivingDNA.com and just request a demo or and, and we'll get in touch with you and find out whether you just want to have a quick conversation or a, long, a, a more in-depth demo, demonstration of giving DNA. That's awesome. Okay, Don and team, thank you guys so much for doing this. I loved the one last year and I'm glad we did it again. We got to do more presentations together. Yeah. Um, I want to thank Bailey and Morgan, everyone on my team, and then Leah, of course, from your side on pulling a lot of this content yep. together. And then uh, for everyone who came, thank you all for your time. We'll send follow up with some some Q and A, some resources, and hope we uh, end up talking to your teams. Have a good one. Thank everyone you have so a good much. rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you, Don.